Next, let's go to John Harvey, who is our chief information officer and chief international correspondent. John is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I know you just got back from having some uh, visiting your, your local dentist. So uh, bear with John a little bit today. Uh, but we're, we're really happy to, uh, to have him making a report. Once again, uh, another proud son of Africa originally. Uh, John was from South Africa. So he will be following up with a technology report, an area of which he has particular expertise. So John, it's over to you. Thank you, Dean. Appreciate that. And um, yeah, very interesting topic, the Sudan. Uh, you know, I'd love to ask some more questions later on, particularly how Israel or the normalization of affairs with Israel has perhaps changed things or had an effect on things. But to technology. So Last week at this time, we were talking about Facebook, which had just announced that it was changing the corporate name to Meta. And since then, the internet, of course, has gone crazy. And there have been a couple of interesting developments. Uh, you know, who knew? I didn't certainly know that uh, Meta in Hebrew apparently means dead. I certainly knew that it was a Greek prefix meaning after or beyond, but dead. So it reminds me of uh, a car or cars or other products that the names were changed to something that people didn't quite understand. So we'll see how this goes. On the name, Facebook apparently made another error and didn't quite do their due diligence and register the meta trademark. And again, apparently there's another company out there that has registered meta in the computer class trademark. So that's kind of interesting. We'll see how that goes. Of course, they made an offer to Facebook to sell the trademark to them for, I think it was 200 million which was rather interesting. And then what we're going to do, as you know, I've alluded to, although we've got sidetracked as we've gone along here, is talk a little bit more about the history of telecommunications, because I think that's really important in terms of understanding what this metaverse is. It's really nothing new. It's an extension of communications, an extension of our want to communicate better. And you know, one only has to look back at, say, the invention of the telephone and the pictures that depict the wires that spanned across buildings to the point that one couldn't see the sky. So you know, it, it just is totally amazing, particularly if one looks at a timeline, how quickly things have happened. So, you know, 1790, let's go through some of these numbers quickly, and I'm going to keep it brief today. But, um, you know, we had someone called Claude Chappé, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But he and his brothers, and this was during the time of the French Revolution, invented something we call semaphore, which is Greek for sign bearer. Um, and in fact, Chappé called he called his invention telegraph and you know that is distance writing in greek and so you know this really was the first instance of being able to send communications over a wide distance prior to that we had certain things like smoke signals and you know flashing surfaces to reflect light but th this really brought it to a organized fashion where you had these semaphore towers on mountains that surrounded the area. And um, the first semaphore was sent on March 2nd, 1791, over a distance of 10 miles. <laughs> I mean, today, 10 miles is trivial. But, you know, that's really where we see the start of the official telecommunications effort 
where it starts going. And um, you know, the, the semaphore is a little bit more technical than perhaps people understand it to be. Probably people are thinking of flags that are held up and used as signal devices. But um, the brothers developed a device where it looked like a clock and had hands that could be moved to different areas of the clock face indicating a different message. So as I said today, you know, we're going to keep things short and I'll be back next week, probably sharing more about the metaverse. And we'll also delve a little bit more into the history of telecommunications because that's so important in terms of being able to understand where people come from and to democratize the world. Thank you, John Harvey from Pittsburgh, signing out. Cheers. Thank you, John. Another in-depth technology report brought to you by Democracy Watch News on our Democracy Cast podcast series. Now we're going to take a, a shift and move on over to Seattle, Washington, where the $15 an hour movement really got its start, where so many reform movements have, have started. Seattle has been recapturing their progressive tradition of good governance and transparency and decentralization, um, as has the state of Oregon. And Seattle is rapidly regaining their progressive uh, identity, uh, much as it had firmly 100 years ago. So Mark, tell us about the election they just had, the local elections in, in Seattle, Washington, and give us all an update. I'm sure people have been paying attention to Seattle generally. And usually uh, Mark is also including in some of his reports, not this week probably, but uh, event uh, happenings about the arts scene in Seattle because Mark is also an accomplished physician, a true Bardic journalist. So Mark, it's over to you. Yes, in a local election that drew some national attention with former presidential candidate Bernie Sanders making endorsements Self-described progressive candidates faced off with more conservative business interests in a series of elections for local offices throughout the city and in Martin Luther King County. All ballots have been dropped off or mailed as of November 3rd, but the elections will not be certified until later this month. Um, the close voting results for elections to the offices of Port Commissioner and Martin Luther King Jr. County Commission were still too close to call as of election night. But Seattle became known recently for its innovative publicly funded city elections, which are also nonpartisan, through a system utilizing what are called democracy vouchers, where all registered voters in the city were given the chance to spend $100 in smaller increments to the candidates of their choice. But as we've seen in national campaigns for office in the United States, a lot of the money uh, that poured into these elections came from outside sources and from outside the city and from local wealthy business interests. Um, Seattle hosts the headquarters for some of the largest uh, multinational corporations on the planet, including Microsoft, Starbucks, Expedia, et cetera. And uh, in the past uh, city council elections, Amazon has attempted to influence the, the vote for city council uh, by flooding uh, the campaign with money, but with only minimal success at this point. But this year, uh, the campaigns for mayor uh, uh, through the primaries and into the general election uh, have been referred to as, um, a, as, as representing a, quote, stark, unquote, difference between the candidates. Um, and in this case, in the general election, Lorena Gonzalez, whose family came to the U.S. as migrant farm workers, and Bruce Harrell, uh, the child of an African-American father and a Japanese mother who was interred with her family by the U.S. government uh, during World War II. They both represent uh, a different um, source of funding for their campaigns. Harrell is supported by corporate business interests, while Lorena Gonzalez, uh, who is the current president of the Seattle City Councils, says that she represents working families and the poor. Um, it looks like the centrist and business-backed candidates have done pretty well. Um, in th at least three of the major races uh, going into uh, the days after the election. In the race for Seattle mayor, former city council president, uh, Bruce Harrell, he was also a uh, council president, was uh, at 65% of the vote over uh, Lorena Gonzalez. So that represented 
at this point, it represents sort of a win for the centrist and business oriented candidates in the city. This uh, follows uh, a year long series of demonstrations where the Seattle Police Department was accused of using uh, copious amounts, unheard of amounts, unprecedented amounts of tear gas, chemical weapons, and uh, so called less lethal weapons on demonstrators throughout uh, the year last year. Um, and it calls for pol police reform um, by mem uh, representatives and members of the Black Lives Matter movement and other folks who have been protesting in the city um, had called for a 50% reduction in the budget for the Seattle Police Department. Under the city council uh, administration headed up by Lorena Gonzalez as president, uh, the Seattle City Council was able to cut funding by about 18%. There were other demands, of course, including the resignation of Mayor Jenny Durkin, who instead of resigning, decided to uh, just not run for office again. Um, but uh, there, let's just say there were some, uh, there are some raw nerves and feelings in Seattle when it comes to issues like police reform. The Seattle Police Department was under a Department of Justice review by the US government for racial profiling and excessive use of force. They are now working under uh, a consent decree, which uh, is which the city is following um, after the Department of Justice review. Um, so Bruce Harrell is definitely does not represent the kind of uh, mayor who will call for the abolition of the police department. He definitely um, seems to be the kind of centrist business oriented person who will probably ask for an increased police budget. Uh, Lorena Gonzalez, on the other hand, uh, and her supporters had uh, called for more budget cuts to the Seattle Police Department. In another race that's brought a lot of controversy into the city, um, Ann Davison um, is, looks like she is winning in the election for city attorney. Ann Davison is a former Democrat who switched to the Republican Party during the Trump uh, administration. And her opponent, Nicole Thomas Kennedy, is a public defender who uh, was accused by her opponents of being a quote, extremist left, leftist radical, unquote. Um, and that kind of red baiting rhetoric in this election has been a major concern for political observers like myself who have been covering these races. Um, it does smacks a little bit of the McCarthyism of the 1950s. Uh, Nicole Thomas Kennedy was very upset at the Seattle Police Department and did tweet out some very, very angry statements uh, about police um, after witnessing uh, what she considered to be police brutality uh, perpetrated against Black Lives Matter protesters and marchers on Capitol Hill and other parts of the city. Um, but it looks like the Republican candidate has actually won an office in Seattle. Now, it's not the mayor's office. It's not a member of the city council. So Ann Davison will not be influencing uh, city policy directly but uh, she does have the opportunity to prosecute um, crimes that uh, are, are in cases that are referred to her and people accused of crimes, including misdemeanors, which our current city council uh, or city attorney, Pete Holmes, had uh, been sort of against. He had dropped a lot of misdemeanor charges. He dropped most, I think all or most of the cannabis charges for people who had um, possessed cannabis before legalization. He was, was at one point at least a very much a reformist uh, city council or city attorney who wanted alternative uh, forms of sentencing rather than putting especially young people and people of color in jail. Uh, in another high profile race for the city council, uh, a brewery owner and former city council aide, Sarah Nelson, uh, looks like she is leading by 60% in her uh, election uh, against Nikita Oliver, a nonprofit leader, poet, and educator, and anti racism activist. Uh, a lot of progressive and left leaning folks in the city had put high hopes on Nikita. She's well respected um, by the Black Lives Matter movement and other folks in the city. However, it looks like uh, the more business oriented, once again, candidate looks like uh, she may win in that race. These are not final uh, results. Uh, the results will not be officially uh, certified until later this month. But in other elections, uh, King County Executive Dow Constantine um, is seeking uh, a fourth term and he looks like he's leading by 57% of the vote against his challenger, uh, State Senator Joe Duane. 
Um, Nguyen was also another uh, reformist candidate who was calling for, you know, an, uh, a let's challenge the status quo and no business as usual sort of agenda. But it looks like Dow Constantine, who has been criticized by some local progressives, but has also had a very good record on environmental and other issues. Uh, he seems to be well in the lead. Um, one of the criticisms against him was that this is his fourth term and it looked like it was time for a change, but the voters decided no. That's in Martin Luther King Jr. County where Seattle is located. Uh, there was also the port commissioners races, which are actually getting some national attention since Bernie Sanders stepped in and um, endorsed two of the candidates. Um, a couple of those races are still too close to call as of this report, um, but the although the port commissioners you know, don't get a lot of press um, in Seattle, they um, do control billions of dollars of trade that go through the port and there are uh, many environmental concerns having to do with trade and shipping. Um, also labor issues um, having to do with the workers at the port, the longshoremen and teamsters especially. So there are all sorts of issues that they um, uh, can be effective on, ch on in the city. So we'll be looking forward to the results of those races. Washington state voters uh, actually rejected a state advisory measure for a 7% uh, capital gains tax um, above $250,000, uh, which was um, an attempt to try to begin to redress the, a very regressive tax system in the state of Washington where there is no state income tax. So multi-billionaires like Bill Gates, you know, our former Paul, uh, our late Paul, Paul Allen, uh, Jeff Bezos and others can live here and escape any kind of income tax, even though they're making multi-billions of dollars. Meanwhile, the, the city's funding for education is uh, um, below par and the state legislature has been actually been uh, cited with being in contempt of court by the Washington State Supreme Court for not adequately funding public education K through 12 in the state and other social um, uh, programs and infrastructure issues have not been addressed because of this lack of um, funding due with, uh, with no state income tax. So that is one issue that you will definitely see, uh, as we say in journalism, it's a story with legs that you will see coming up again and again in Washington state until finally uh, a Democrat, probably since they tend to be in the majority in the state legislature and in the governor's office, will finally step forward and say, yes, we need a state income tax. Um, actually, one of the richest uh, people in the world, Bill Gates has spoken out in favor of an income tax. And I think they well know, the billionaires that live in Washington state, that it's an incredible tax haven for them and their businesses. Um, by the way, the Washington vote on rejecting uh, the 7% uh, gain, capital gains tax was only an advisory uh, measure. It was non-binding and really doesn't change any existing laws, but it was just a way of voters to express the, uh, their opinion on that matter. So this is Mark Taylor Canfield in Seattle. Uh, reporting on the Seattle and Martin Luther King Jr. County elections, uh, where it looks like progressives and centrist business candidates have faced off yet again in uh, the Emerald City. Thank you, Mark. That was Mark Taylor Canfield, who also serves as our editor for Press Freedom, and as well as our uh, maintaining our special relationship for us with the art scene in Seattle, a major hub in the Pacific Northwest at the very least. That's all for this episode of Democracy Cast, which is available on TuneIn Radio and Stitcher, as well as to many of your favorite podcast providers. This is Dean Edwards, International Coordinating Editor for Democracy Watch News, signing off and inviting you to join us again next week. Bye for now. Okay, right. Well, let's see roughly how long did we have there. Let me see whether I can get a count on this. We can open up the mics. And... Thank you, everybody. Those were great reports, especially the reports on Africa. I appreciate that very much.
So let's yeah, see. I, we I were... definitely be you know interested to uh, hear more about um, you know how the normalization of affairs or relations with Israel have changed things or haven't changed things or anything to do with that. Well, I I personally um um I know this is something. It's a topic that I think may be of interest outside of Sudan, but I have to say as a Sudanese, I'm not interested in it. I don't think a lot of Sudanese are. I so think we're- It, it yeah. hasn't made any difference then, that, that's what you're saying. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, at this moment, I don't see it as consequential. Um, obviously, this is not something that most Sudanese are interested in. They're not interested in, um, it's, it's, it's not something that most people have in their every day to day concerns. Um, their concerns right now are about matters of the state, matters of existentialism, matters of, matters of government. Um, I think if anything, then this question really fits into a picture of external interference. And if we're talking about external interference, then logically what we have to talk about is the first order of external interference in Sudanese affairs. The first order of external interference in Sudanese affairs at this moment is not Israel. It's Egypt. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's Egypt and the Emirates, the United Arab, Arab Emirates. Um, uh, you know, they are the primary uh, backers of this push. Um, I, uh, I know Dr. Hassan earlier said that he took exception with the description that this coup was called a coup attempt and not a coup, uh, I have to go on the other direction. I think it's very prudent for the media to, and for the narrative to be that it is called a coup attempt. It's only a coup when you accept the outcome of a coup, when you fully accept the new sovereign as the power, uh, as the having power over the state. That's not what I'm seeing, objectively speaking. It's not just a matter of you know my wishes. What I'm seeing is a rejection of this coup attempt. Uh, what I'm seeing right now is that we have a situation where we have an illegal, illegal detention of government officials who have been given a mandate to govern uh, in, um, after the 2018 revolution. Uh, when I say, when, when you hear 2018 revolution, please understand that the revolution began in December, 2018 and extended into the mid 2019. So it's it's a multi uh, month process that crosses, uh, it straddles years. In any case, um, that culminated in a new government in a, a new transitional government. And that transitional government is um, kind of was formed organically uh, in different layers. Uh, and I have to apologize. I do have some, uh, if you hear anything in the background, I unfortunately have some uh, activity going on and I, I couldn't avoid it. I couldn't, uh, I tried to get away from it, but it's, so just let me know if you, um, if you want me to repeat any point, but my point, what, what I wanted to say is basically the protests that, that led to the, um, with the popular uprising uh, that led to uh, Omar al-Bashir, the, the former sitting president, who, by the way, I have to say, the former president who was deposed was himself a product of a coup. He caused a coup in 1989. So he was an illegitimate government. And I, I, I come back to this. This is why I, I took exception with Dr. Hassan's characterization. It is illegal to do a coup. So we are in a, an illegal state of affairs. As long as people understand that, as long as people comprehend that, we are in a good situation. But once people start accepting that this is a legitimate coup, then we're, it's, then we're back to ground zero and then we're legitimizing an illegal government, an illegal state. So um, let me just get back to the point before I go up too, too, off, uh, too far off on a tangent. The protests were led by a, an association known as the Sudanese Professionals Association. And, or it, it's an association in Sudan that is composed of different uh, professions. And they started to uh, organize the mass protests because the mass protests were leaderless. Now, typically you would expect in, a, in mass protests, you would expect some leadership, some parties, political parties to emerge and help to take, take um, control 
over the protests. But no, this was not the case. There was no one leader, no one party that was capable of harnessing the discontent, the popular discontent. So it, it fell on the uh, on the SPA, and the SPA then um, was was able to uh, lead, and and the, and the popular protests were able to force the army's hand to take Omar al Bashir out of power. Now that was in in of itself a coup, uh, and it, you know it was rejected actually by once once the coup was done, it was rejected by what became known as the Forces for Freedom of Change. The SPA formed into a bigger organization called the FFC. And it's not so much that it's an organized organization. It's a really a loose coalition of different factions, different parties, political parties in Sudan. But in any case, this, it was, it was in, uh, functional enough to be able to speak for the, on behalf of the people. Now, I wanna remind everybody, we are talking about an, an unelected body here. So it's very difficult for any, any body to assert that it has the, the, a popular mandate to carry forth with the people's demands. So we're talking about here a, a moment of creation, right? This is an, it's, not a, it's not a democracy yet. And so we have to make exceptions. We have to make allowances. And, and power structures evolve naturally in these conditions where people accept this group of people represents us. And that was the case. The FFC spoke for the people. Now, what happened is you had certain people within the FFC who did not accept the military as the sovereign. And the military saw itself as a sovereign and it, it tried to make that point to the civilians of, of le leading the uh, protests. And the civilians said, no, you're not. How can you say that? You're not even an elected government. He wasn't elected. He wasn't elected into power. How, how can you say you're elected into power? Initially, the FFC, I think, this is my understanding from my discussions with uh, my readings. Initially, the FFC tried to form its own government amongst, uh, amongst the different parties. But that, that I, I think that it became apparent that given the, 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 in, the infighting, even amongst people who are what I would call civilian uh, Democrats in some way, shape or form, realize that they can't, that cannot materialize the second thing I, I heard was a very interesting argument from um, a, a person called um, uh, Kamal Yusuf Omar, or Khalid Yusuf Omar. Um, I apologize, it was a little, uh, uh, Khalid, Khalid Yusuf Omar said uh, basically that, do you want, do you, he, he, he posed this question to a bunch, to a, 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 a bunch of angry Sudanese who were really fiercely uh, upset with him and the other members of the FFC for, 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 for forming an agreement with the military. And he, he said to them, and I agree with him, he said to them, do you guys understand that we have five major armies in this land? Do you understand that? How do you think, how do you suppose we're supposed to just form a government and fulfill your mandate, which is peace, justice, uh, and freedom? How do you suppose we're supposed to do that? We can't do that. We have five armed groups. We have five armed groups fighting each other. We have to try to form some sort of coalition that serves all our interests in the end and try to discuss this, try to reason this out. Now, I'm, I'm just making the argument that he, he gave to, this, to the, a bunch of really angry protesters. There are a lot of people who have disagree with that till this day. I am not one of them. I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. I understand, I, I, I read enough of Sudan, I understand enough of its history, and I, just, I see as an as a outsider insider, I'm not totally an insider Sudanese, but I, when I look at it from the outsider, I see a divided country. It's a divided people. It's so many, there are many ethnic groups. It's a vast country. It's a country whose people, frankly, don't even understand how big the country is. I'll be very honest with you. And I'm, I, maybe some people might take exception to that, but I, I'm speaking as somebody who listens to people, listens to them discuss, talk about Sudan, and I'll, I'll be, it's, we don't have a critical mass of people who really understand the enormity of the challenge of governing this country, the size of it. Sudan alone used to be about a quarter the size of the United States uh, with South Sudan a long time ago. It used to be a quarter the size of the United States. You have a country a quarter the size of the United States with all these ethnic groups. It's a artificial, with artificial boundaries since independence, of course they don't know what to do. 